I want to throw in some ideas for you that you can implement when you come back to work. But some companies also want to ensure that their application if, or is of a certain quality before it's released to production. I think it's about creating the process to deliver software to production, to uh, facilitate continuous uh, learning. And I don't think you can just establish the process and it will be working for you. You need to constantly iterate and make it better. And I believe that quality is a lot more important than speed. Look, is about uh, build, ship and run. So on continuous delivery, I think we're talking about build, test, deploy. You need it to be different from master only with the code that you have created. And if you keep it, just create a container and then the same thing will be deployed over and over again. You need to invest heavily in automated testing. You just start coding. There is no work for you in the future, sorry. The testing pyramid is here to rescue, of course. Uh, try to focus and create a test as low in the pyramid as possible. If the test suite has passed and everything is green, it doesn't mean that your software doesn't have bugs. It means that you haven't found them. Well, deployments are super easy with Docker. For something more complex, well, we need to some of those guys. And, and there is a big chance that if you iterate through a lot of ideas, you will just accidentally find something that users need, just because you are faster. Uh, the biggest question is here, are we making money or are we losing money? And distributed systems are hard to operate, but containers make them easier. If you got Amazon or something, well, you might not want to use Docker because the uh, DTAP streets are from the old world. Where... Okay, so, so the question is how do we get companies to test in production? I think that uh, the crucial and missing part here is metrics. A big round of applause for Pavel, please. Mm. Okay, so my name is Pavel Chinyaev and I'm Continuous Delivery Architect at Liver T Services. With uh, my daily work, I help our customers to assess, create or optimize the way they deliver software to production. And this is my passion and I would like to share it with you. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about Docker and Continuous Delivery, uh, why I think Docker is crucial to achieve Continuous Delivery, why it's not enough, and uh, fortunately for you, after two technical talks, it won't be deep technical because I want to throw in some ideas for you that you can implement when you come back to work. Uh, exact technical implementations you will figure out yourself. Okay, so the talk will take about 25 minutes depending on how fast I go, which things I forget, um, but yeah, we'll see. So, a couple words about the company I work for. Uh, we are Levi9 and we develop software. This is uh, what we do. We do it good. We are known for our customer intimacy and our motto is one common goal. We are a company of almost 600 people. We work in Ukraine, Romania, Serbia. And we had office in Donetsk in Eastern Ukraine, not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we work mostly at the Dutch market. Some known names. KPN should be there. Oh, no, sorry. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not prepared, sorry. Um, yeah, some customers are outside, but mostly here at Dutch. And uh, with the recent HRT survey for customer satisfaction for outsourcing performance, we reached 100 satisfaction uh, percent, so this is cool. A <laughs> uh, couple words about me. I started working in 2004, uh, quite long ago, probably. I come from Ukraine uh, and uh, I was also living in Estonia for some years and a year ago I moved in here and so far I like it a lot. Yeah, great country, guys. I'm learning Dutch. Uh, it goes okay -ish. Well, I can already understand uh, when sometimes you're speaking slowly and about simple things. I hope in one month or two I will be able to start talking to somebody else than my Dutch teacher. Uh, we'll see. Yes. I also love cycling. Uh, this year I um, participated in, in Alp Duzas. This is um, um, cancer. Well, event to raise money for to fight cancer, and uh, I rode just one time, unfortunately, to Alpdias Mountain, 14 kilometers up. Really, I'm proud of myself. And uh, yeah, next year I'm going to participate in Holland 100. This is an event organized to raise money for um, leukemia, no? Yeah. 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 
uh, and it's organized by one of our founders, Ben Bernard Falan Rahim. Uh, yeah, uh, 10 kilometers skating, 90 kilometers cycling. I never skated in my life. <laughs> so I'm kind of scared, but well, this is what yeah, we have to do. Okay, so there is no link, but you can find me and you donate some money if you like it. Okay, now a bit more to what we are uh, well, talking about. So continuous delivery. Um, whenever I'm talking about continuous delivery, this is actually... I'm talking about to create a way of safely, uh, predictably, uh, safely, rapidly, and also predictably, most importantly, deliver software to production. This is uh, what well, I'm doing, and this is, I think, what all of us should be doing to create and optimize these ways. When we're talking continuous delivery, we're talking about these things. Faster time to market, how many deployments a day, you can brag about this, how much time it takes, still you deploy. But I think it's not only about this, it's not only about speed. Now speed is the, well, was historically the most visible part of continuous delivery. Um, I don't think it's, uh, well, the, the, the most of what you should focus about. So some companies have different agenda. Um, okay. You might need time to market, but also you might need to create a controlled and predictable process just to know when things are happening, how they're happening, and to be able to tell well when this is going to happen. Uh, but some company also wants to create um, and to ensure that their application if, or is of a certain quality before it's released to production. I believe that continuous delivery process is well created for that. It's not about automating deployment. A lot of just people on the internet think, okay, we automated deployment to test the environment. Here we are, we are doing continuous delivery. It's not enough, I believe. Uh, it's not about just creating a continuous delivery pipeline and executing it. It's, again, a bit more. And uh, I think it's about creating the process to deliver software to production, to uh, facilitate continuous uh, learning and continuous improvement. Because I don't think you can just establish the process and it will be working for you. You need to constantly iterate and make it better. And unless you create a possibility for people to do that, well, it's not enough. And also, well, uh, create proper testing to be able to deliver at high speed. I will talk about this because I believe that quality is a lot more important than speed. And unless you establish quality, speed is not needed. Now, Docker. Docker doesn't solve a lot of issues. Yeah. <laughs> it solves exactly one, and I believe it solves it brief, b brilliantly. And this is called infrastructure. A couple of years ago, any DevOps and use delivery uh, guy could say, okay, you've got problems uh, with how you deliver software, automate your infrastructure. Super simple, just go. Uh, configuration is code, environments is code, super simple. Now, well, it's no longer the case because we've got Docker who can solve this for you. And Docker has created really new ways of doing this. Um, and yeah, we need to employ them. So, whenever we are talking about Docker, Docker is about uh, build, ship and run. So this like three words module, they do it in uh, all the presentations, everything. Really is this. You can build your ship run. When we're talking about continuous delivery, I think we're talking about build, test, deploy. And from this I think you can already see um, where Docker interacts with continuous delivery and where not. If not, well, I will explain in more details. Now, continuous delivery pipeline. Um, it's an implementation of continuous delivery ideas just put into process or into the blocks. I, I think you've seen this a lot of times, so this pilot it starts with the building, then deploying to test environment, then running test, then uh, uh, deploying to stage environment, testing again, and then releasing. I believe this is not enough. I think we should uh, do something more and we should, do, we should be talking about this pipeline. This is exactly what happens with anything you want to introduce into your software application. It starts with the initial idea, then it goes through the planning, through development, through build stage, through all sorts of testing, regardless which ones of them, to release and then to operation. Only here we can think, because every idea passes through this stage. And if you omit all of this, well, you're missing the whole picture. 
Now I'm going to go and discuss each stage in more details. Uh, and also discuss how Docker applies to each stage. So it starts with inception, and this is maybe the hardest part. Because you need to create an idea for your application that then will be delivered. And uh, yeah, you just need to create it. And uh, this is, uh, yeah, there are no rules here. And for a lot of companies, well, actually, yeah, uh, first of all, that this is possibility of product management, uh, program management, it's not possibility of developer or of some people. And a lot of ideas needs validation because uh, you don't always know what exactly users want. And uh, you want to try something. And uh, this is why actually we start with this, because then we will validate it at the end and I will talk more about this. And this is why flow time is important. So there is an idea of cycle time, what happens once uh, the software reaches continuous integration, build server, and then it is deployed. Flow time is what happens when the idea is generated and when you can deliver it to production. And this is very crucial. And well, Docker can't do anything here. Then we go to planning stage, and this is already just going on a level a uh, bit uh, deeper, or uh, lower, because uh, this is where ideas, business ideas are refined into something more tangible, something that well, developers get used to be working with. Uh, they're refined into epic stories, or regardless how you refine uh, and build it in smaller th uh, things. Then, well, you create also uh, all the requirements, acceptance criteria, test criteria. Here I can say, well, you better think about using BDD because BDD uh, gives one addition, uh, great advantage. It gives a tool to business people to, to describe the acceptance criteria with the given when then or something like that. Given that feature is available on the website, I open it, I'm impressed and I'd like to spend all my money. <laughs> Docker has well, nothing to do with this stage anyway. And this is uh, where we reach development, and this is uh, where the magic happens. <laughs> because, well, some smart people are uh, earning all the money because this stage exists. <laughs> so this stage code is created along with everything that is needed to deliver a feature to production. It can be tests, it can be infrastructure, it can be some additional scripts, um, any, anything here. And um, if we think what developers need during development, yeah, they need a production-like environment, especially if then you are coding on Windows, like I am, or Mac OS, and then you're running on Linux. Uh, well, I've seen companies that, okay, they create this local environment, install Tomcat or something on Windows, but then they deploy on Linux. It has nothing to do with it. Um, Environment quick to start. Again, I've seen projects where it takes a uh, poor guy three days to create local environment, and only then he can start doing something. What the hell? Uh, it needs to be repeatable and reproducible. If something went wrong, if environment got uh, dirty, you need to quickly uh, cycle it. And if it takes you another three days, well, <laughs> bad luck. And of course, it needs to be fast feedback. You change something uh, in your code, and you want to quickly see what happens. And this is the first continuous delivery stage where uh, Docker applies. Because, yeah, running local environments has never been so easy. Okay, we had Vagrant, yes. But then whoever who worked with Vagrant, and especially if you start several of them, knows that, mm, yeah, it leaves something to be desired. And uh, Docker is great here. I actually think that Docker appeared because of developers, because they were so tired of waiting for ICT people to generate environments for them. And Vagrant was so slow that they just invented, okay, let's create our own way of doing things. And here is where Docker appeared. Uh, this is also, oh yeah, this is also, um, I think, the stage where a lot of companies start investigating Docker. Because, well, it's afraid, it's just a new thing, <laughs> it needs to do, do the direct deployment to production completely. Oh, it has only two years, Docker. Well, this is like too young. And, but companies start doing this with development, some with more success than others. Um, another thing I want to mention that Docker allows you to stop mocking your services. 
Okay, you can't uh, stop mocking Google or any third-party services, but if you are developing, well, microservices, uh, the first time I said it, if I said it five times, like, uh, shout bingo. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, uh, if uh, you are developing uh, th this architecture, you can start the services your service rely uh, upon, and uh, yeah, stop mocking. I really believe this is a big advantage. But then we move to integration stage. And, well, as I said, most people uh, think that Canadian delivery starts here. I think it starts a bit earlier. And this is a fundamental practice for continuous delivery. If you're not doing continuous integration, you can't deliver at speed and you can't ensure quality. Again, I've seen uh, still maybe a couple of years ago, Companies who were lazy in first developer needed to build uh, application on their laptop and then it's somehow released to production. This is not a reproducible way of running things and you need to enable this reproducible way. Um, additionally, what happens here? So uh, the idea is that uh, you need to run your continuous integration, you need to build whatever you are, uh, have committed something to your master branch. And uh, there is, well, not debate, but when you go, there is a common advice that you should not use feature branching and you should use trunk based development. I believe this is hard for a lot of teams to do because uh, feature branches are also all advantages. Uh, and you can make those work with only two things if they are short lived. So, short uh, days, maybe, not weeks, and definitely not months. <laughs> uh, and if you constantly update your code against master, it can be done automatically. Some people don't like it automatically. But the main idea is that whenever you're talking on a feature branch, or you're working on a feature branch, you need it to uh, be different from master only with the code that you have created. And if you keep it like that, it's manageable. Because again, not every project can uh, use feature toggling or other techniques that allow you to automatically disable on uh, well, work in progress on production environment. Or you are doomed uh, to manually merge something into master whenever you want to, to release. I believe that is not the way to go. Docker. Docker changes actually a lot with the building. First of all, you can start building containers instead of application. And okay, if you are, we're talking about Java or .NET, it's not a big deal. Uh, we were delivering binaries all this year, so it's okay. But for interpreted codes, uh, the things are completely different. And I've seen uh, deployment scenarios where you need to SSH to the server, run git pull, and suddenly, oh, release. I believe you need to work with binaries, or at least packages that you can deploy. And you create package only once, and then it can travel across environments. And if you're working with source code, well, you can't uh, do it. But now the tool is here. If you're using Python, or Ruby, or PHP, no problem, just do it. Just create a container and then the same thing will be deployed over and over again. You can run continuous integration containers. Uh, as a result, you will have a lot more Jenkins slaves or Go CD nodes or Team City agents. But another idea that also happens well, to be discussed on the internet is create self built containers. This is the idea that, well, you create uh, the tool that will be used to build your application or to package your application. And it also gives you great benefits of doing this uniformly on developer laptop, uh, laptop and on continuous integration server. So, yeah, and some people depart from that to the idea that you don't need continuous integration server at all. Because, well, if you've got your own pass, OpenShift, or <laughs> Elastic Beanstalk, or whatever, you can uh, use something like Git hooks. So, okay, we commit it, let's run our container, that will be our, our application, and then we'll deploy it somewhere. I still believe that, uh, well, this is a very radical idea. I don't think it's needed for a lot of companies because, well, some companies need control again and reports and to be able to see history. If you don't save it additionally, well, if you start to create uh, another services that will do it for you, well, you will create your own continuous integration system. But, well, it's possible if you want. Uh, and uh, here I'd also like to mention that uh, microservices are a lot easier with containers. Uh, containers are not required for microservices. But then when you're doing this at scale, and when we're talking about like not one, two, three, but tens of services, it's just a lot easier to package them in a predictable way. 
And now we move to test, the most important uh, stage, as I say. And yeah, you need to invest heavily in automated testing. You just can't live anymore with the idea that you can test your software manually. This is just, this doesn't scale. You just haven't got enough time to do so. No, you can't. And if you are manual QA here suddenly, just well, start coding. If your system administrator that installs manually, just start coding. There is no work for you in the future, sorry. <laughs> you need to become a developer. Because well, automation QA is essentially a software developer that doesn't create software code, but creates things that help releasing software. It cre he creates this or she. Same with the system administrator, DevOps people. Well, it's not no longer services uh, you, that you are installing manually, but you're creating it as a code to do it at scale. And here, of course, I need to mention the idea of uh, testing pyramid, because this is the, I think, uh, so okay, a lot of people struggle with testing. And uh, testing pyramid is here to rescue, of course. So the idea is that uh, <coughs> when we go from bottom to up, uh, from top to bottom, um, this is the, first of all, the amount of uh, tests you should have. But this is also the amount of time it takes to run those tests. So um, manual testing is very, very long and requires a lot of time. And to end testing, well, still a lot of time. But unit testing takes milliseconds, if not seconds. But also when we go from bottom to top, um, we like go higher and higher to abstract what's happening in the code. So if a unit test fails, you know exactly what fails and what to fix. But if end-to-end -end test fails, well, good luck finding out where exactly your bug is. And, uh, well, if you're a software developer and work with bugs, you probably know what I'm talking about. It takes you three hours to find out what exactly failed and then five minutes to fix it. And this is a common thing to do. This is why I actually don't like end-to-end -end tests. They are like watchdog to me. Okay, something has broken, the dog barks, uh, but you need to go outside and figure out yourself what has happened. And uh, the same happens there. And same with manual testing. It's but on the other side of this story, uh, end-to-end tests are really descriptive for business people because it uh, describes in their own language what software should have. But for developers, not. Again, if you're creating automated tests, focus, uh, try to focus and create a test as low in the pyramid as possible. Uh -huh, another idea. It's called uh, moving tests to the left in lean terminology. This is the idea that says the earlier you find bug in the process, the cheaper and easier it is to fix. Mm -hmm. And also, well, this is also why manual testing is not as good because most manual testing comes at the end of the sprint and suddenly we will test the software, find the bugs and fix them in the next sprint. Uh, quality can't be ensured like that, I'm afraid. So we need to do it a lot earlier. And also another thing that we need to do it over and over again, the same things. Only then we, we can be sure uh, in something. And if you can't do it, well, you have your own test in the first place. You must run it all the time. If it takes too long, well, you need to optimize or change something. Uh, create more tests uh, closer towards the bottom of the pyramid. Docker. Docker, I think, helps a lot with testing. You can provision a lot more environments to run the test. When I'm talking to developers, it's always, uh, I want to test on a clean environment. Ideally, for developer, each test a new environment. Of course, it's not always possible because it's, it will require too much time, but ideally it's like that. And Docker provides a way to create uh, always fresh, quick, um, uh, repeatable environments that are always up to date and they immutable. Well, if you change something, it, well, it doesn't happen. You need to just recreate them again all over. And this is easy. Additionally, of course, uh, Docker can help with the testing infrastructure. Uh, for example, Notorious is uh, you can run Selenium in Docker and, for example, run special Selenium for um, any environment, for all your applications. Don't run just one big uh, Selenium hub, um, but run it. And, yeah, additionally, you can create testing containers in the same way as uh, there are build containers. For the same reason, to uniformly test uh, your application on your laptop while you're developing, but also in your pipeline. Do it in exactly the same manner. And actually another idea to throw in about testing is called testing in production. <laughs> 
I know how it sounds. All these years, I've also been taught that well, testing production is something bad, something wrong, and whoever does that well, they're out of their mind. But I believe that we are moving towards going there. Uh, of course, there are some prerequisites. You can't just well code something and deploy it to production. Uh, you need to ensure quality. But then um, it happens that, um, well, if we think a bit of abstractly about the test case and test suites we have, um, if the test suite has passed and everything is green, it doesn't mean that your software doesn't have bugs. It means that you haven't found them. <laughs> yeah. And here also another idea is that you always cover, well, with testing it's kind of synthetic. It's what you think the users are doing and it's what you think the load will be. And for companies like Facebook, for example, you can't even try to test the load, that it will be real. And here the idea is that you've got real users, you've got your use cases, and you can test in production. And well, here the idea is that you try to deploy it. If something goes wrong, you immediately take it down. But then it can happen. And I I think a lot of us will be doing this in the coming years. Um, but well, again, you need to be <laughs> really prepared to try that. Uh, don't tell anyone. <laughs> Releasing and uh, most important thing here is that a release is not deployment. A deployment is uh, a way of uh, well, technical thing to bring a code <coughs> to production or to any environment. Release is a marketing event. Well, wow, we release new feature. Here you are. Just go and use it and bring us your money. And they need to be separated. So you, th that's why you can actually uh, deploy a lot of times, but then release a uh, lot le less frequently. And well, I talked to some companies, and then it happens that they just don't want to release frequently. They say, uh, if we just do it uh, very often, the customers will lose focus of what we're delivering. We want to do it like once a month and then do it like a big event, send an email, this is the list of features, everything is here. And there is, uh, that's why they're saying we shouldn't deploy uh, more frequently. There is no actually contradiction here. You can deploy very frequently, but then, well, do release uh, turn on features uh, when uh, they're ready to go. Another idea here with releases is that uh, why people also move into microservices? Because it's hard to release big applications. <laughs> You're counting, okay? Um, when um, we are talking about uh, microservices, that we are splitting our application into smaller things, and then we can independently release them, and ideally they shouldn't affect each other. And Again, you can't do it unless it's automated, unless you've got really robust process to do it. But then um, you can also do, of course, your big application, but it's generally a lot harder. And well, I think it's must have uh, either of this technique, blue-green deployment, canary deployment, or um, rolling. They are more or less of the same, so blue-green, you know what it is, sometimes it's called black-red, I think, in OpenShift it's called, no? Okay, sorry then, uh, then it's somewhere else. But then, yeah, the idea is that you create the same set of infrastructure and switch, uh, switch to, to new application version, and then you've got good uh, rollback scenario, just switch it back. Uh, can, can canary is the idea, okay, that you deploy uh, your new version of application alongside, uh, send some small amount of traffic, and uh, you constantly compare your metrics to run an application, if everything's fine, then you can, for example, move to run and release, just uh, start uh, uh, changing one system one by one, or increase the amount of traffic until it reaches 100%, and then release is done, actually, it's over. And Docker shines here. Well, deployments are uh, super easy with the Docker. Of course, um, we're talking about mostly about simple scenarios. If you run an application of one or two containers, everything is fine. You just click, it's deployed. Uh, for something more complex, well, we need to, uh, some of those guys, and I believe you are capable of choosing one plant from yourself. Uh, OpenShift is not there, sorry. <laughs> But well, Kubernetes is, and this is also what you, you're running. And not Elastic Beanstalk, but Elastic Container Service. Now, operation. This is, well, probably another most important area, because this is actually why we are doing all this. Why? To just put it there. Because this is where money is generated. 
we put new features just to, well, to get more money, actually. Well, of course, to please our users, uh, everything that, but, but essentially to get more money from them. And unless we can do it quickly and in a predictable manner, again, we're doing this wrong. And as I mentioned, this is where ideas are validated. Because then, when you try it and, uh, and your new feature is working in production, you can think, okay, are users using it? Do we need to invest more, maybe some additional things? Or do we need to scrap it and remove it from our source code because n n no one needs it? And um, in a lot of um, lean, well, idea is that uh, there is competition between companies, yes? And sometimes just uh, people just don't know what users will like. And there is a big chance that if you iterate through a lot of ideas, and uh, more ideas than your competitors, you will just accidentally find something that users need, just because you are faster and you can validate your ideas quicker. And then in uh, a concept like Lean Startup or Lean Enterprise, this is called validated learning loops, uh, when you, you create some hypothesis and uh, try, uh, you code it, so you try in production, you see if your hypothesis is okay or not. Uh, but also, yeah, for normal companies who are not doing this, you want to streamline. Because uh, you invest in a lot of effort and a lot of money in each of this stage. And if, and well, developer time costs a lot of money, let's be frank, uh, the, the salaries are big. And then if this code is just lying somewhere and not generating money, this is a waste. This is a waste of money and waste of time. Well, here you better monitor business metrics, CPU usage, no one cares about those. Uh, the biggest question is here, are we making money or are we losing money right now? And th this is actually, well, everything else need, need, needs to be subscribed to, to that. You want to create metrics that will show you the answer to, to this question. Uh, and this might be number of users currently on the website, but might be s something else. It's specific to the application. And if you want to focus on some things here with the failures, then you need to focus in the meantime to detect your failure. Uh, ideally, it should be before your users know. And meantime, to, to recover. Ideally, it should be seconds, of course. And Docker helps here. And distributed systems are hard to operate, like really, really hard, because you can't understand uh, the whole system, how it's working. But again, I believe most of us are going to do it in coming years anyway. <laughs> yeah. And then Docker. Um, yeah, scaling is easy. We were shown this uh, two times already, this, uh, the, this meetup. And yeah, it helps. You can run uh, Phoenix servers, immutable infrastructure, just well, do a lot of things that you couldn't do earlier um, unless you're using Docker. And yeah, monitoring containers, um, this is still kind of a problematic side of containers. But it's getting easier, it's getting better, there are products that, that appear on the market. Yeah, I think, yeah, a couple months, maybe a year, and there will be good, good solutions. There are already, actually. And distributed system, as I mentioned, is uh, running them is hard, but containers make them easier. Mm. Well, it depends. Yeah. Your, your mileage <laughs> may vary, you know. <laughs> okay, uh, going towards the end already. So, as I mentioned, Docker is about build, cheap, run, and continuous delivery is about build, test, test, deploy. And from this, well, you can see what the Docker helps and what not. And if you don't, I have to key takeaways. So, Docker doesn't. And Docker doesn't solve quality for you. You have to do it yourself. Uh, Docker doesn't create good product ideas. No, you have to do it yourself. And Docker doesn't improve your software development process. You need to organize everything yourself. However, Docker does create new ways to manage your infrastructure, and I believe you, you need to do it. And Docker does create new ways to run your applications in production, and I also believe you have to do it. And uh, yeah, this is it. Thank you. to ask you about boundaries. What's the project you think you would not suggest to go with Docker? I don't know. This isn't my answer. It's up to you. So you need to, to, to think of that. I think uh, Docker, again, it solves the issues of infrastructure. 
if you haven't got issues with infrastructure, if you can easily create everything, maybe Docker is not for you. But most uh, teams I've seen, they've got some issues with infrastructure. Again, I still uh, go to sometimes to uh, assignments at companies that it is okay to wait three days to create VM and you can't do it yourself. Or companies that, well, a uh, system administrator has like a long list of tasks and an average wait time for your ticket to be, be picked up is, well, days. Or you need to come and yell really loud and whoever yells the loudest, he gets his time of system administrator. But then if you haven't got any issues with infrastructure already, if you got, M, uh, for example, Amazon or something, well, you might not want to use Docker because the Docker indeed provides uh, some complexity. Right. Uh, it's uh, harder to do a lot of things with Docker, uh, but for a lot of companies it solves the issue of infrastructure because you can get it easily in predictable manner and, uh, well, the same on all environment. Did I answer your question? <laughs> Refine it? I think we have to ask people. Well, I'll say it, I will repeat. But the question is, if uh, we don't have staging, uh, well, we deliver to production, but what to do with the companies uh, who have still DTAP streets or staging environments and everything, right? Okay. So, first of all, again, I didn't say you don't need staging environments, you don't need this. You need environments to create, uh, well, to test your application. It's just, I think, with the Docker and then when doing this on scale and microservices, yes, <laughs> then, uh, <laughs> then you, 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 the idea of staging environment just loses its, sense, uh, loses its sense because you create a lot of environments and they are on demand. So you spin up environments with the seconds, you run your tests, your test pass, environment is destroyed. So the uh, DTAP street and all these ideas that, well, uh, they are, I think they're from the old world where we had to wait for our VMs to service and then redeploy to those servers. And then we had test server where some people were doing the manually testing. We had staging where we show into business owners some, business owners some code and and they were accepting it through exploratory testing. I believe we are departing from these DTAP ideas. Uh, but, but again, I do believe that you need to run your testing. It's just, well, if you can call this, I don't know, ephemeral staging environment or ephemeral staging environment whenever you need it. They're just created on demand just before your tests are run. Uh, I don't think you need to have a dedicated staging server anymore. Did I answer? So the question is, how do we get companies to uh, test in production? I think that uh, the crucial and missing part here is metrics and all these deployment uh, process. So you need to have a robust deployment process, canary the releases, for example, with the rolling, but then you need to monitor metrics. Because if uh, the idea here is that, uh, for example, well, you don't test, but you test in production that you deploy there, just 1% of users or 0.1% of users will be affected if something is broken there. And you will identify it immediately and get application done. So, yeah, just to answer your question, the way is to think of this matrix to identify it and create a robust deployment process. Any more? Then thank you again. Thank you.